Welcome everyone. Today we have Roxandra Popescu in the house. She's gonna show us Quill to Lens Studio. So Roxandra, take it away. Hi everyone and thank you for joining. We're gonna start the class today by exporting our assets from Quill. As I'm gonna export these assets separately, even though I have them all in one file. Because there's Is this some... animated? Oh yeah, so one of them is the mm -hmm. animated fish and the other one is a still. But I'm going to be using both, so um, I'm just going to export them together. I'm going to explain um, why I'm exporting them separately once we get into the uh, Lens Studio. So first I'm going to delete uh, the extras in here. So I only have the fish. And then I'll export it here. Uh, so what we want to do uh, for Lens Studio to be able to read the animation is to bake it. So export meshes, bake animation, and export animation. And now I'm going to export both linear and gamma color space because there's some really cool stuff we can do with it uh, later on. So I'm going to say linear here so I know which one it is. And export. And then I'm going to go gamma. And export this as well. Now I'm going to undo the other layers because I do want to export them as well. And I'm going to get rid of the fish. So I'm just going to export them together as well. Exactly a quick same. note on the export work center if you just hide the layers they won't export oh right yep. okay yeah oh no um they they still appear in lens studio they come really? up as empty folders but they they still export and you end up with this huge high oh, it sh shouldn't okay sorry my bad but um it, it actually shouldn't but um only if you have the export hidden checkbox on but um i'll check if that happens but... hmm. See, see, there's a checkbox export in. If that is unchecked, it should actually just export whatever you see. But mm -hmm. um, we can check later. So yeah. Uh, yeah, let's let's yeah, we'll we'll check it now. Let, so. Let's do it your way. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have gamma and linear. Yeah, so it doesn't export the contents of of the folders. But oh, will, by the hierarchy. Uh, yeah, yeah, they do still appear in the hierarchy. Okay. So, oh, actually, I had them turned off. That's my my mistake. But that's okay. We'll just quickly go and re-export them. Perfect. So now we have so all the assets we need, <laughs> <laughs> and we are safe to go ahead. So now we're going to go straight. Oh, actually, before we uh, go into the creation process here, I do want to talk quickly about Snapchat itself. Um, I think it's really good to sort of incorporate it in a Quill pipeline because, well, as everyone knows, you can, um, you can generate a lot of assets quickly with Quill, but then uh, Snapchat itself as a platform I looked it up and it has it has something crazy like there it is 265 million daily <laughs> active users. That is insane. I mean that's something that um you know your work can reach a lot of people by uh, creating this workflow. And I think it's something that us as artists should not um, should not disregard. Uh, That's crazy. Isn't it? And yeah. now I want to talk about something else quickly. I looked up, th this is something that I like to do whenever I uh, work with a new platform. I like to look up some statistics to see, first of all, how people use it and what people get out of it. I think that's super important because, you know, you can, you can basically take the work you have in Quill just as it is and export it to uh, all sorts of different platforms. You can create that kind of similar content but i think that's not taking advantage of the individual platforms themselves and 
why shouldn't we? Especially if we want if we want people to see our work, you know. And um, yeah, so I found this uh, uh, this article here that actually goes into the individual platforms insights and the uh, <laughs> the emotions that are associated with Snapchat usually are silly, creative, adventurous, excited, happy, playful. These are things that we can focus on whenever uh, we do our work for the platform itself. And um, I kind of chose to focus on the playful and excited and happy. And now I want to make another point as well. Um, I'm new to the platform, so I haven't, um, I haven't created for it until now. And uh, maybe to just give you a quick idea, I've uploaded my first filter five days ago, and it's already had close to 15,000 views, which personally, wow. I think it's amazing. That is amazing. Isn't it? Because you... W without a following, right? Yeah, without yeah. a following. That's honestly the first thing that uh, that I've made for Snapchat. Um, and I haven't, I haven't really promoted it either. Uh, there are ways to access it, of course, because it's public, but... Um, what I'm saying is just that I didn't make an effort to publicize it. Yeah, you would think because it's oversaturated platforms, um, <laughs> you get less visibility, but 14,000 is um, without a following is like pretty amazing. Yeah, I would say so too. Yeah, It's definitely cool. worth considering, I would say. Yeah. But then again, I think, I think that depends on, um, on the work that you upload as well. So, uh, it goes back to what we looked at here. Uh, like you need to explore the ideas that uh, people want to see on the platform, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's cool. important to give you a direction as well. So uh, to get Lens Studio, uh, you just go to the Lens Studio website and you can download it from here. Download. Okay. And uh, it's really easy to install and you don't actually have to do any sort of special setup. Um, it's just very quickly to set up. And also whenever you get Lens Studio, you're going to want to get Snap Camera as well, because you're going to need it if you want to plug in your filters into Zoom or Discord, by the way, they work on Discord as well. Oh, nice. And um, yeah, it, it will allow you to uh, test your filters. Cool. Okay. So very easy to set up. Also very easy to get started with it. It's um, it's very friendly to new users. Yeah. And obviously it has a massive layer of complexity uh, that mm. if you want to make uh, games or anything like that, you can. Um, so you can see some of the templates here where um, they make use of more complex uh, script setups. Mm. So you can, it kind of gives you an idea of what you can do with it, but um, you you need to be careful whenever you use the template. So like, <laughs> they have scripts plugged in, scripts plugged in, scripts, uh, and you're just gonna have to spend a bit of time to sort of track down um, uh, the what is it, the inputs of each script and what it's doing. Otherwise, uh, if you're just gonna throw your assets in there, you, you can break. Uh, you can break yeah. the connections and it's not going to work. So anyway, we're going to start a new project. Again, you can choose a template from uh, from the list, but uh, for this class, we're just going to go ahead with an empty scene. So first, we are going to add a face mesh. We're also going to add a head mesh. So you need a uh, head binding for anything that you upload into the, um, if you're making a, ca a, a lens for the front camera of the phone and you want things to be tracked to the, to the face or the head, you're going to want to use um, either a face mesh or a head mesh. So I'm going to go with both because I I'm going to show you why. So first of all, we're going to import our fish assets. So I'm going to import both of them 
to show the difference in color. Also, I'm going to untick this for now so we can see what's happening. So when you created them in Quill, did you just create them randomly at size or did you have like a head mesh reference in there to make sure that it's in the right position or something like that or you don't worry about that? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I didn't I didn't actually uh, take any templates inside or um, I, I just sort of created randomly to uh, actually not randomly but applied to Quill's um, Quills metrics. So, so again, it's in the center of the grid. Yeah. And again, yeah. just like Unity, uh, assets made in Quill will be uh, way smaller, like 100 yeah. times smaller, is it? Yeah. Um, yeah. So you can uh, you can take that into account whenever you make your assets, but it's not really uh, going to impact the way you the way you work with it. So I'm going to close this real quick so I can rotate them. Uh, you'll notice every now and then that there's really small um, bugs with the uh, with the uh, gimbals here. Like now it's working fine, but every now and then, even when you click on it and drag, um, it deselects. Um, it's just it's just a little hiccup because it's a very complex software for for what it's doing. So whenever you import your assets, they do come with materials attached to them. What you want to do here to sort of get it to work, you basically just uh, select your material and select base color. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's, it's there, very simple. Yeah, super easy to set up. Uh, the only thing you may want to do now is for single sided and double sided materials. So this is single sided. I'm going to leave it as it is just uh, made it a bit brighter. And then the double-sided material. Ooh. To get it to render both sides, you just tick up here to side it. And yeah, now it looks like it has both of them. We're going to apply the same um, the same material to, to these guys here. So single-sided and <laughs> double-sided. So one is gamma, one is linear. Yeah. So this one here, the lighter one, is gamma. And I think that's the one you're supposed to export. Looks true to Quill, right? Yeah, yeah. It's the most, uh, it's the truest to Quill. But um, I have to say, I kind of prefer the linear because what you can do with it now, um, you can, yeah. So you can come here and recolor what you did. So. Yeah, there we go. So um, I had uh, I had two of the uh, materials from before attached to it, and I changed only one. So uh, the, I had two mesh visuals in here, but one of them was still having the old input that made it a bit darker. So with the new material, which is basically the same thing, base color, and just your normal colors here. You go to recolor and then you can adjust, readjust your, um, readjust your palette, basically. If you did the same thing with the other one, uh, you end up with the faded out, a much more faded out sort of uh, palette. Again, it's up to you, but there is something that I think you can use to your advantage. Mm. Um, so, I'm probably going to get rid of this one. Yeah, I'm going to get rid of the of the linear one. That's truer to the to the color and quill. And just go ahead with the gamma one. Let's see how it's And going. I saw when you apply materials, you have to make sure you select all frames, right? Like yeah. off the FBX. Yeah. But yeah, okay. uh, fortunately, you don't have to go through them individually. Yeah. So what I want to do right now to sort of attach it to the head is just place it within the head mesh head binding. And I know we don't see it here anymore. But that's because we've turned it off. So you want to reposition them again. 
to sort of fit around the model that you that you're going with and I'm gonna turn off the the still one I'm just gonna keep the animated one just gonna place it probably a little bit behind and lower Yeah, that, that looks okay. And now... Yeah, so now as we can see here, in the simulation, it's tracking with the with the head, which is kind of what I want to do. I want people to be able to have it like um, a sort of friendly head attachment. <laughs> so I'm going to go back to cool. the idle person. Now we're going to turn off the head mesh because we're not actually going to use it but we are going to use a couple more assets so we're going to go ahead and first import a screen image okay and put it to fill and i'm going to import my vignette probably going to put it on maybe something like that so it's a little bit like it's underwater. And I'm also going to import the bubbles that I have. Okay, so whenever you import to get the animation, you can just leave it as it is. Uh, but whenever you import static objects, you can um, untick animation curve, animation, uh, vertex animation, and blend shape animation. Because obviously you're not using it, but I'm using it here. So I'm going to go ahead with it. And the uh, um, FTX animations, they loop automatically, right? Yeah, yeah. So you don't have to do anything um, yeah. to, to make them loop. But um, the reason why I exported them separately, again, is because uh, whenever you have a scene in Quill, and say you have your loops, right, but they're not the same length, whenever mm -hmm. you import them at the same time uh, from the same FBX, it will always loop at the longest yeah. loop. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I exported them separately. Yeah. Any any animation with different durations should be a separate object, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna go in here and again select my bubbles. And I'm gonna use the same material because I don't want to use too many different materials. All of them sort of uh, pile up here in the um, yeah, and the max um, size of the of your scene. So the max size is four megabytes, and um, poly yeah. count is dependent on the max size. Uh, so poly count doesn't really matter unless you have super highly detailed um, assets in there. But I can tell you that uh, this fish, for example, um, mm. unoptimized, it came in at I think six megabytes. Okay, so you, you basically are limited to the megabyte size, right? To the yeah. overall size. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. Uh, you can sort of get away with the uh, more effects and stuff like that by um, rendering out uh, GIFs <laughs> of what you make in code or uh, using the particle system. I'm, I'm going to go over the particle system real quick uh, towards the end as well. But uh, now we're just going to use this because it's not that heavy. And Already looks amazing. <laughs> we're not going to want to track the bubbles. So I'm just going to leave them where they are. But um, I will want to take out the eyes and <laughs> the teeth because we're going to do um, we're going to do a, an interaction here. So finish this. Okay, so the way you do it is you come up here and you go to helper scripts and you add a behavior script. Okay. And I'm probably gonna do it on face event mouth open response type set enable and I'm going to move these 
we are going to want these to be tracked to the head. So actually, let's do it right now. Yeah, I'll just put them in there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And let me make them bigger just a little bit. Let's see. Yeah, they're a bit too far away. That looks okay. Now I'm gonna drag in the the teeth here as well. Oh, the head biting. Um, they're already in a better position, so I don't need to do much to them, just... Okay. And also I think it's best to rotate them so that they sort of mold all on the on the shape of the mouth. I'm going to use an occluder material to make it look like uh, they're you know, underneath the uh, top lip, <laughs> because <laughs> right now they're a bit crazy looking. So they're not in a bad position. I'm just going to leave them there, but I am going to add a, yeah, a box will do. And make it a bit smaller so it fits our need. And drag it into head binding as well. Mm. That looks okay. So what you can do if um, if you want to be super accurate, you can uh, bring uh, the head mesh model into Quill and just sort of uh, paint a mesh on the same um, on the same shape as the head or the lip. Mm. But uh, we're not going to do that right now. So, so I'm going to go here and create a shader or rather import the graph occluder and it did nothing. So I'm going to do it again. Okay, so it did, it did automatically go into, um, into the folder I had selected, I think. So hmm. I'm just going to use the first one. That's fine. Oh, wow. That looks like Perfect place. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably gonna make the eyes a little bit bigger, um, so it matches the fish a bit more, and reposition them. Just a little bit. Yeah, that looks fine to me. And okay, so we turn off the head mesh again. Okay. And again, we can't see uh, the box and we shouldn't be able to see the box. To get this to not show up at the beginning, we need to set up a new behavior. So I'm going to rename this. No. Movement, because that's where we're going to have our um, mouth movement scripts. And this is where we're going to have our uh, lens on script. So basically, we choose whenever the lens is turned on, and we say set enable, and we choose disable, and then we plug in our, our fish eyes. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, it automatically updated. And I'm gonna duplicate this and change the input to the teeth and mm. we're going to go into mouth movement and we have we already have face event mouth open set enable okay we're going to choose the fish eyes and say enable duplicate it and do the same with the teeth and i'm going to try a toggle instead of enable because um, sometimes sometimes um, it it lags whenever it reads your facial expression and you can have a bit of jittering so 
We'll see if Toggle works better. So let's find someone with the... Oh, her again? Yeah. Someone over. Yeah. So this is how you're uh, toggling between the... Uh, um, between the meshes. But uh, you can also do it so that it closes, I mean, it turns off automatically whenever your mouth returns to, to normal. So we just have to uh, set these to enable. That took a little bit off again. I removed it. Okay. And whenever mouth is closed, um, we disable teeth. So yeah, we can already see mm. uh, it does it automatically. But uh, I, I actually kind of like the toggle, so I'm just going to get rid of it. I just want so to toggle just... would do it every other other repeat or? Yeah, so toggle would yeah. uh, put it on and off every single time you, yeah. OK. I, I kind of prefer it because it does give users the opportunity to uh, leave the effect on if they want to like take a picture or a little video, whereas it might be oh, a bit more I difficult. See. So, yeah. I see. So when you open your mouth, then it, it's like a switch. Yeah. Versus a trigger by a dynamic trigger. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, I see. It makes it a little, a little bit easier on the user. I see, OK. A bit more accessible. Now, obviously, um, you can you can do something else as well if you like. Here, um, I haven't tried it yet, so I don't know what it's gonna look like. But we're we're gonna do it now and see. It might look horrible. So I'm gonna take the fish out of there, just because I wanted to get it out of the uh, the group. But I still want it in the head binding, and I'm gonna turn it on. And for this, we would need to remove the, the box as well. Okay, and maybe go for idle for a second. And you can, if you want, just replace the, the person's head with, the, with one of your quilt models. Um, I, would probably not recommend replacing someone's head entirely with uh, a model exported directly because um, while it will track on the head, it's not going to track any of the uh, facial expressions. So it's going to look a bit weird. <laughs> but then again, that might be something you want. So it depends on what you're going for. So that, that looks, you know, fun if you have... Oh, no. <laughs> 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 it's still tracking the uh, the face the face movement there, so it's activating <laughs> what we had. But yeah, basically, you you get the um, you get the idea. Yeah, that, that works well with like if you would create like a mask or something, right? You can just drag it on top and cover the yeah. whole face. And... Yeah, yeah. So masks would yeah. uh, work perfectly here. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so I'm gonna turn it off because we're not gonna do that. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> We're, um, yeah, okay. We're gonna go back to, you actually have a good selection of um, people in there. I think that's really useful for whenever you're doing um, shoulder segmentation and stuff like that, because everyone has different shoulders and different um, sort of shoulder weight. So, you know, if you're using just um, one model to track, uh, it might look good, but just for that one model. Um, and then it will look terrible whenever you want to try it on yourself or something, or someone else. So um, another thing to consider here is that the uh, meshes that you have, they don't actually, they're not processed, uh, they're, they're processed only once. So even if you have 10 duplicates of the same... Oh, it becomes an instance. Yeah, it's an instance. Yeah. That's nice. So you don't have to worry about um, about uh, size. You can do so that. So what, what is the longest loop you created? Like, um, 
for example, like the fish, right? If you would have like a four seconds loop, that's never gonna fit within four megabytes, right? Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I so, had I had a second for for this fish initially, and it was looking gorgeous, but even on the fullest um, optimized, um, hmm. yeah, on the fullest optimized um, version. <laughs> yeah, version. Yeah. It's still it was still too much, way too much to uh, fit in here. It it's not even gonna process so, it. So so this fish is like eight frames now or something like that. Um. Yeah. It's actually a bit longer, but um, it is it is looking weird, I have to say. So we did export it. <laughs> we did export it separately. I think um, maybe what happened was probably one of those folders I didn't get rid of properly. So that's interfering with the. Uh, it's interfering with the fish loop, but normally it shouldn't. Um, it it should loop perfectly. I see it would be like a floating idle position. Yeah. All right. So uh, some people like to do this. Uh, this is up to you. Um, it does help sometimes if you're doing any like effects. Um, if you want to add uh, makeup on the person, so you can go with uh, stuff like. And um, in, in this case, you know, I would probably go with some blue hues and stuff. Okay, so here it is in Makeup Controller. I'd probably just make everything sort of blue um, to fit in with our ocean theme here. Let's just go with some... Can you make the hair red? <laughs> <laughs> for the for the hair, you actually need... Um, you don't have a template here. You need to build a different controller okay. specific to hair controllers. Um, Um, yeah. There we go. So you can, you can leave. Oh, that's probably. Yeah, I, I'm happy with that. So. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. So here we have a little issue where the um, where the makeup goes over the, <laughs> goes over the model. Mm. So perhaps it's not the best for this one. But anyway, it's really easy to add if you want to add it in there. So we're just going to leave it as it is there. And uh, now I'm actually going to go back to the material that we made, this one here, because I want to show you something really cool. Okay, so we make a new material, PB, PBR. Okay, and you can input it in your uh, model on top of the on top of the material that you already have. So you can layer them if you would like to get a different type of effect. Mm. Maybe you want to add, um, maybe you want to add a little texture in there. So then again, you would drag it in here. You can already see it's updating. I'm gonna go to base color again and Oh, which one is it here? No specular. That's looking a little bit weird, so I'm just going to recolor it again and make it a bit darker. As you can see, you can make things look quite different from what you have in Quill. You can also add post effects from here. VHS effect. We already have something funky going on. So if you want to change it, you choose your material from here. And I'm going to turn off all of this stuff. And perhaps just give a bit of saturation. Also, I'm going to get rid of that material because I don't quite like it. But I did want to show you that um, you can layer them to create um, different effects. Mm. OK. And where are we going to do Oh, yes. We are going to import a sound as well. So whenever whenever the uh, user opens their map, it also makes a bubble noise. So we go back to the mouse script and add another component. Script. Script 
drag our sound into here so I'm gonna turn the sound off right now because I don't want to hear it continuously and uh, quickly it's probably a good time to save okay and now if at this point um, maybe sometimes earlier in the process, you may want to test. So the way you do it is you pair your phone up here. Now I have my phone already paired to, um, to the desktop application, but if you don't, then it will give you the option to do so. And it will give you a snap code that you can just scan and it automatically uh, pairs your phone with it. Basically you just send it to your device and it's gonna give you some information on the performance of your lens as well. This is a good indicator as well if it's going to do well or not, but um, it's always good to test it on your phone because I personally, I found a lot of bugs like that. Mm. Um, usually with tracking or, you know, just face events. Also, one more thing I want to say is that you can't import uh, transparent meshes. Um, oh, that's good to know. Yeah. So the way you have them in Quill won't... Um, it, the material won't read that transparency, but um, you can definitely play around with the, you know, with the materials that you that you have from here. So, which um, is why here in the bubbles you scale them down instead of making them transparent, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, actually, that's a good point. Maybe maybe we add um, that material we made that we're not going to use on the other one. I think it might work good on. It might work well on the bubbles. So we can do a bit more um, coloring here. I quite like this because it does give you um, a good uh, level of uh, customization if you haven't already done it in Quill. Also, you may find that whenever you export to your phone or send to your phone, uh, the colors look off. Um, and sometimes maybe it's good to make things a bit more saturated and a bit more contrasting in here because phones normally don't have the same. Um, uh, oh, so it's different from phone to phone. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, 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 uh, absolutely, yes. So basically the problem is that the vertex color information doesn't read the alpha channel, right? It's just the RGB values, but mm -hmm. not the alpha. But yeah. if they would support it, then I wonder if if you use a different, basically the standard vertex color, uh, vertex color um, information, it only reads the RGB values, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I wonder if you could build a shader that reads out the alpha value as well that you can apply on it. But um... I think you can because uh, uh, so say we have um, a new material, you can open it in the graph. So here you can you can actually do you can actually remove um, inputs and add more nodes. Yeah, it's super I'm complex. almost sure you can you can plug in the transparency value. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. So I'm gonna get rid of it. We're still fine. Yeah. Okay. So we save. We go back to our scene. And what you do now, you uh, go to Project Info to give you uh, your scene a name. So I'm just gonna say lens. And I'm gonna untick rear camera because we're not obviously not using it. Um, also, actually, before we try to upload, I want to quickly go over uh, particles because you can use the system as well to sort of add um, textures that you've made in Quill as particles. So you select it from, from here, particle emitter material, and 
we're going to go with probably a box spun, so it's a little bit um, wider. I'm going to give it much higher values. So, mm -hmm. so now we have an emitter that covers the whole scene. And you can change your textures from here, but it's really cool because you can um, you can bring in GIFs that you've made be uh, beforehand. So for example, um, I have in here, I've exported um, a video from Quill. I mean, I've exported yeah, <laughs> these uh, stars that I've made in Quill and then turned them into a GIF. And we're going to bring that in here and go back to our particle emitter and plug in the texture in there. Oh, so now we have the little stars. And obviously it can be anything else. Um, it doesn't have to be this. Um, so now we actually see it without the, um, the alpha because we don't have an alpha in this one in my texture. So I'm just going to go to screen maybe. Yeah, no, it looks kind of cute. You can also change the, the colors. Start. The possibilities. Yeah, <laughs> it's actually really cool. Um, yes, I'm probably going to go with something like that. So um, going back to the uh, project info, uh, you go here so you can add your icon. And this is what will appear um, underneath your camera view in, uh, in Snapchat. So that looks kind of fun. Oh, the filter button? Yeah, under the filter. It's always good to add a lens preview as well. It gives people um, a good idea of what of what your filter is about. So we're going to choose someone with open mouth. <laughs> I like this one because it actually shows your uh, head tracking and is the only one that um, has more body movement. Um, so as per probably all of my other filters, I'm just going to go with this one <laughs> <laughs> and say apply. And again, we check this. Here is where you can add a hint for the user. So whenever you turn on the lens, it will tell you what you should do to interact with the lens. Um, so we have a mouth open event, so I'm just going to open your mouth. Okay. So that's that's what's going to appear uh, for anyone that turns on the lens. We say apply. And then we go to publish lens. Okay. And this automatically takes you here and you go to submit new lens and we say fish, um, water, that's fine. Um, person and it's public, but you can also uh, choose to publish hidden or um, offline lenses. And that's it. That's basically it uploaded. And now it's in review and the review process actually takes very little time, uh, sometimes a few minutes even. Uh, hmm. You are not going to be able to find it immediately through normal searches. So I think the database, the database takes a bit longer to um, update. But um, you should be able to find it in half a day later, I think I've noticed the, at the latest uh, through normal searches. So that's it. That's your, that's your list published. And whenever uh, you want to say, say you've made a mistake or uh, maybe you want to change uh, something or update one of your assets, uh, you can always go back to uh, publish and then it's going to process um, again whatever you've done and then just say update an existing lens and then you, oh, that's it cool. here. Oh, you can see it's already been approved wow so, so basically um you maintain all the statistics on the file while yeah. you can update the content yes and awesome. um also related to that it's good to not delete your files whenever you've made a lens because just like um, VR chat, it sort of it preserves the metadata in your file. 
So if I delete this uh, file and then I want to update the lens, I'm not going to be able to because I can't no. update over it. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. You would have to publish a new one, right? Yeah, you have to yeah. uh, publish a new one. There is something else you can do with the um, occluders. I found whenever, let's save this. So I can show you properly what I mean in this one. Okay, so in this <laughs> filter, I have a cat attached to someone's head, to the user's head. And I actually had a little um, uh, issue where, well, I mean, it wasn't an issue. It's just the way it works. So if you have an occluder uh, material, it will occlude absolutely everything in, in the scene. I'm going to delete all of it because it's a little bit difficult to tell. Okay, so while it's occluding the, the cat, and that's what we want, that's what we wanted to do. As you can see, the uh, uh, the paws are not in front as they should be. So even if you put them here, you know, you're just gonna be detached then. So what we want to do is to duplicate. So I'm gonna duplicate the cap and turn off everything but the pause. So even if you duplicate it just like that, it's an instance? Uh, yeah, it's an instance, okay. so it's not it's not going to affect at all. Mm, OK. You see? Cool. Yeah. Um, OK. So cat folder, uh, pause. OK. So we have the pause in here. and. What we're going to do is attach second uploader. Okay. And you make that second occluder. Yeah. You make that second occluder uh, to have the um, depth function always uh, disabled. Okay. Yeah. So one of them has to be less equal than the other. And that's how you occlude your occluder, basically. So you can uh, make assets appear in front of materials that otherwise would not show them or uh, obscure them. It's just uh, something that you can play around with. And let's get rid of this as well. This is one that I used recently. I think this is a little bit more suited for um, work exported from Quill, um, so that it gives you an opportunity to sort of explore the the scene a little bit more, instead of what we have in the in the other filter, where it's just stuff that's made for the front camera. So this is mainly made for the rear camera, and the reason why you may sometimes want to use templates is because. Um, they have different um, camera trackings in there. Um, you can do that stuff yourself uh, from scratch, but um, they're really useful for speeding up um, for speeding up one of your for speeding up your processes. Okay, so I'm gonna go in here and bring in one of my assets. I'm actually going to bring in more because I do want to show something else that uh, maybe you can use to your advantage. So I don't have animation, so I'm just going to import it as it is without the uh, resampling. And always to sort of um, get the controllers to work on your assets, you have to drag them underneath. Okay. And the camera is basically where your eye level is going to be. So we need to be careful with that. I'm just going to move it a little bit down. That looks fun. OK, maybe down there. It's not going to be on the um, actual ground, but um, it's going to be at a decent sort of eye level. I'm going to get rid of these um, assets we don't, we don't need. And Be 
possibilità. Ok? Ok, so something I wanted to talk about is um, see the way you export from Quill, it saves um, saves, you know, the uh, color information and um, you can apply your own shaders like we did before. We can layer a PBR shader and um, a normal unlit shader, but whenever you export FBX and then you upload it into something like Blender or Maya and then you re-export it <laughs> into an FBX, you get, um, you get much stronger um, shade shadows in there. Uh, you can use that if you if you have still if you have still models that uh, maybe you want to look a little bit more three D than your uh, softer shadows the way they're exported raw from Quill then you can you can do that and play around with it. So is Definitely. that right? The right one is straight out of Quill and the left one is from um, Blender. Or? Yeah. So this is just hmm. straight out of Quill and this one is just uh, an import export from Blender. I I didn't even do anything. It's just I think it bakes um, hmm. some of that information on your um, on your model. Do you so. lose the vertex color information on the Blender? Model? No, no, not at all. Uh, okay. That's the fun thing, and that's why I wanted to mention it because it can be used um, it can be used as a as a technique uh, hmm. if you like. So again, I've put the same material on both of them. So we can see the difference between them. Oh, wow. Yeah. I also flipped the normals, of course. Uh, yeah. that, that's the main reason why I brought it in, uh, in Maya. But uh, yeah, as you can see, it already looks way more 3D than what we have here um, because of how the shadow is baked onto it. Um, but yeah, th those are all good things to keep in mind. I'm actually using this to make a little uh, game in here, but um, I'm still working on, um, you know, I'm not a coder, so I need to learn how to use uh, the more complex side of um, script interaction in there. Okay. And I'm going to close this for now and show you how with the snap camera downloaded, you can attach it to your Zoom. So open Zoom, go to video, and it automatically pops into your uh, camera input. Um, as you can see, it's actually overriding my normal live camera, but that's not a problem. So, so we go into Zoom and we open the snap camera. And now you can you can type in your username, your Snapchat username, and it'll uh, give you the uh, filters that you have already. So I'm just so now you can use this um, this selection here, the Snap camera, and you can go live on Zoom, and uh, you know recreate the lawyer in trouble. <laughs> 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 yeah. Also, what you can do if you like, um, I've already uh, prepped this, so you can go to background and filters, and you can import your normal. Um, you can import just uh, images that you've made in Quill, and now it's it's going to track uh, around you, so it's not going to track whatever filter you have mm. um, on top of you. So maybe. I disable that, but uh, this is how you can super quickly just, um, I'm going to say it, quillify your life. <laughs> <laughs> can you show some of your other filters in, in Zoom again? Yes, of right. course. So actually, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share this. Um, these are the filters that I already have published. So you oh, can, cool. uh, you can scan, I mean, you can turn on Snapchat on your phone right now and, um, with the, uh, with the back camera of your phone, you can uh, scan each individual filter and get access to them. Uh, the same way we did the um, the mouth um, behavior, 
the mouse script behavior. Um, maybe I should go over that again quickly now. Um, you can just very quickly replace that interaction with something else in the list. That's super, super handy. And um, maybe you can activate stuff like um, on tap. Um, also, you, you do have the option of adding in delays if you want to uh, maybe make a bunch of um, things appear on screen uh, at an offset. So the way you do it is you go back to your script, yeah? And uh, say we go with, oh, not face event, touch event. And we say tap, mm, set enable, or, you know, you have a, a bunch of other options in here. Um, again, you do have to rig your characters if you want them to um, track facial expressions. Um, so that's another step that uh, you can add in there if you want to have that sort of extra layer of complexity. You can have fun with them. And uh, I think I've seen a lot of people uh, prefer, you know, having their whole head sort of changed. <laughs> It depends. I mean, some users are a bit camera shy, some, some aren't. And um, I think it's a fine line of trying different things, um, see what works, if you want to create specifically for the platform. So um, like we were doing before there, maybe maybe I go into the actual, um, into the actual project there. Yeah, this one here. Yeah. So, in this lens here, which we can see playing in the on the right side of the screen, um, I have it so that you have to tap to enable it. And then what it does is um, it shows you these uh, little critters around you. And <laughs> but I think this is more, I wouldn't say it that it's a Snapchat specific sort of um, interaction or anything like that. I, I think it's just basically me wanting to display a bit of my work. Um, so the intention that you have behind every project matters because you do have to consider why uh, people would want to interact with your work and how they should interact with your work. And normally Snapchat is a platform that's used. Um, it's used by people who want to communicate with their friends mostly. So, um, you know, what do you do when every talk to your friends, you just want to have a laugh or you want to share something cute or, um, you know, that, that sort of sometimes more wholesome interaction, <laughs> I would say, and more, more user driven. So even though, you know, your work is um, enhancing the experience of using Snapchat, um, it's all about the individual user. So each person is actually at the center of what you're doing. And hmm. personally, I quite, I quite like that. Um, Basson is asking, can you make Instagram filters too? Yes, but not with Lens Studio. You need to use Spark AR. So it works uh, pretty similar to, to this, to Lens Studio, to what we have here. I haven't tried it yet, but I really want to get into it because um, I think it has, well, I think you can kind of do similar things with that, but um, there is a whole different interaction with Instagram. Um, yeah. or the way people uh, interact with Instagram filters, I think it's very different from the way they interact with Snapchat filters. And that is definitely something I want to get into as a creator. Yeah. It's so crazy to think that just looking at this filter that you created, what kind of work would have to go into it if you would do it with like traditional 3D approaches, right? <laughs> oh my gosh. Like, <laughs> you would have to rig it, you would have to texture yeah. it, UV wrap it and everything, right? Like. Yeah. Because this, this looks pretty complex. It looks 2D, but it is 3D, you know, like, yeah. like that, I think that's the power of this workflow, right? That you can like maintain all the, the, the personal, like your personal style, your mm -hmm. handwriting basically 100% maintained uh, and just put it into like any AR camera. That's pretty awesome how yeah. streamlined it is. Yeah, yeah. And um, the fact that, you know, I actually looked this up as well. so. Um, the estimation for 2021, so this year, is that 3.8 billion people have smartphones. 
so <laughs> potential access to to this platform you know obviously not all of them have it or use it but um the potential is there and that simple fact you know that you you go into vr and then you create something um something in your style you know you you produce something uh, and then you make it available for people anywhere in the world and i think that sort of brings it back a little bit to reality um so again it's just sharing your work on a different level i suppose another aspect of um, your life yeah with a different purpose yeah, it's, yeah. it's really really cool yeah so this is where i kind of layered um one normal quill shader and then a pbr shader that i turned into glass and just gave some sort of textures and um transparency input and i know it looks super funky but i think that's mostly because i have the uh, vhs filter activated here turn it off from here but uh, you can definitely layer all sorts of um, effects and textures and materials so you can yeah you can go extra creative if you like and i think super that's it cool. Super cool, Alexandra. Thank you so much for running this class. Um, if you can share this image into the text chat as well, so we can find your filters, um, <clears throat> that would be cool. So we can all check it out. And I really hope to see a lot of AR filters coming out of Quillions. <laughs> Quillions. <laughs> Quillions. <laughs> I like it. Cool.